Well, I want to begin today by saying welcome home. Welcome to all of you who haven't been here uh, for a number of weeks, even months. Uh, Welcome to those of you watching online uh, at our Pecola campus. Uh, Welcome to each of you. I remember when I was in college, and, uh, you know, you take off to college, you you think, you know, I'm going to go live my life, it's going to be great, I won't have any of the things that, you know, like all the constraints I had at home. Uh, And I remember going to college and living, I lived with three other guys, so four guys in one house. Um, It was a little different than my home. Uh, It it had a tendency to get a little bit messy, uh, wasn't nearly as clean, and I was the clean one which would tell you that my house was really not very clean. I, I had some really, really messy roommates that lived upstairs. Me and the um, somewhat clean guy, we shared kind of the downstairs area, but it still wasn't all that great. And, and I remember coming home after being away in college and being reminded that home wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was when I, I lived there before. I came home to a house that was spotless, and I didn't have to clean it, right? Like my mom had handled those things, and, and, and really, if, if, if you've ever kind of gone back home or you think back to what feels like home to you, there's probably some important distinctives, like some things that make it stand out, like this is what made it feel like home to you. When I would go home from college, the thing that would make it feel like home to me is we would gather around the kitchen table. My mom would cook some epic meal that I never got in college, right? We would sit And we would just enjoy each other. And so my family, we were talkers. We'd sit around the table and visit about whatever, maybe move to the living room. And we would talk about God or we would talk about family or we would solve all of the world's problems down to the very last one. You know, we'd just sit and enjoy. And it felt like home. My dad had this old ghetto recliner and we were like, we pleaded with him for years to get rid of it. Uh, But thinking back, that kind of reminds me of home. That felt normal. Uh, Another distinctive about my home uh, that reminded me like, oh, I'm, I'm home, was the smell of bacon cooking in the morning. Like God has given us graces in this life that we should enjoy and appreciate it. And bacon, the smell of bacon cooking in the morning is one of those things that I'm like, I'm home. Like I have a right. This is what I want in my future, right? It just felt right. Like this is what it means to be home. Uh, another thing that I would have never thought I would value when I was younger was to go out and to work in the yard with my dad. Now, my dad and I did not always enjoy those times together when I was younger, but as I came back from college, it just reminded me, like, oh, this is, this is my childhood. This is what I did. It felt like home. Uh, what I want to do for you today, uh, just kind of speak about our church specifically, I want to kind of point out some of our distinctives to you. The distinctives that make us cross-community church, that kind of tell you what we're about, the things that make us who we are. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. As I begin today, I'm going to begin kind of like surface level. I mean, like I'm going to begin with what I would call a given, all right? So distinctive number one, just so you kind of know on the front end, we are a church. I know, write that down, right? Everyone's like, oh, great. No, we are a church, and that's an important distinction. So uh, we are not a social club. We are not a political organization. We're not just a place that people gather, but we are the church of Jesus Christ. And the reason that that is so critical to know, the reason that is so important for us is as you look at the world around you, you see the brokenness, you see the pain, you see the anger and the violence and the rioting and the looting. What we have to be reminded of is that we are the church. As a matter of fact, we are the hope of the world. And and I say that, you remember when, when Jesus was here, He was walking in flesh, and people wanted to know God. They wanted to know the truth. They wanted to know the way they could physically follow Jesus. But when Jesus went to the cross, grave, ascended into heaven, you know what he did? He sent his spirit to not be in one man, in the person of Jesus on earth, but instead to live within the church. Do you know the solution to the darkness that's going on in the world around us? Do you know it's not that we just gather here and kind of pat each other on the back and say nice things? It's that we would be the church, that we would take the light that God has placed within us, and we would go after the darkness. We are the church of Jesus Christ. We are the hope of the world, and there isn't another hope. Like There's no other mechanism that God has ordained to bring light into the darkness besides his church. 
He purchased us with his own blood, and he's called us to go and to make disciples, to bring help to the helpless and hope to the hopeless. We are the hope of the world, and it's not in our own strength. It's in the power of Jesus Christ, but we, as we gather here across community, we are a church, and I'm just going to say this to you. Our goal as we gather here in this place, it's not to make you comfortable. Like, obviously, we want air conditioning, and we have padded chairs. We used to have these ghetto gray ones that hurt like you'd sit in when we were poor. We have some nice things here, but our goal is not just to make people comfortable as they come into a building. Our goal is to see every man and woman child who comes into this place be conformed into the image of God, and we want to commission them to go out and be the church to the world. So given number one, if you want to know who we are, we are a church. Now, a few things about our church, to be really clear for you, the head of our church is Jesus. I'll read this to you, just to kind of point you to where we are in Scripture. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, Paul says, he, talking about Jesus, is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn, firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will have to come, will, sorry, will come to fir- have first place in everything. This is God's church. He is in charge. You know, I am not the head of this church. Our elders are not the head of this church. Majority vote is not the head of this church. This church belongs to Jesus Christ. He is the head. Now, we see that God would lead us and direct us through sometimes votes and sometimes elders. Like, we, we get that. But at the end of the day, the moment this ceases to be Jesus Christ church, it ceases to be a church at all. Like we're just wasting our time. We should go home. So Jesus is the head of our church. Now, a couple of things that that's going to bring forth here, right? Um, First of all, if Jesus is the head, we are going to be grounded in the word and guided by his spirit. You know, I have my ideas about how things should go in the world. I don't know how many of you have been uh, maybe visiting with friends about how to fix all the problems in our society. Surely you've had some of those. Some of you, I've seen you on Facebook, right? You're trying to like solve the world's problems there on Facebook. Here's the thing. What Jesus Christ has given us as his church, he's called us to be the hope of the world, light in the darkness. He has given us his word to guide us. And he's given us his, or his word in which to kind of teach us, to show us the truth, and the spirit to guide us as we live out that word. We are going to be unapologetically biblical here. Can I just tell you that doesn't necessarily make us popular in culture? Have y'all seen this shift? Over time, culture will be here one day and over there the next. The winds of culture blow and they change, but the word of the Lord, it stands forever. So we are going to be unapologetically biblical, grounded in the Word, and guided by the Holy Spirit of God. Sometimes that's going to make people upset. But what we are going to do is stand on the truth of the Word and just remind people, like, hey, this is what Jesus Christ has given us. There's kind of a couple of approaches to um, our our faith. Um, First is revelation, which means we look at the words of Scripture. We think through the lens of the words of Scripture. We reason with the Scriptures. Like we are, are grounded in the Word of God, consistently asking the question, what does God's Word have to say about that? Like if you um, have an issue with something that's going on in our church, like we would love to hear about that. And what we want to hear is what the Word of God has to say about it. If we're not doing it right, we want to know it. You know the conversations we really don't want to have? Conversations about the color of the carpet or the style of music, or, or those sorts of things that are just simply not within the Word. What we want to be above all else is biblical, grounded in the Word, and guided by the Spirit. We're called to be God's church. He is the head. If He's not leading, this thing is really, really broken, and we're never going to accomplish what God has called us to accomplish. So we unapologetically preach and call men and women to trust in God, to obey Jesus Christ and faithfulness to God's word. Now, if Jesus is the head, that means that we are the body. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 tells us this. It says, now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. And so we are this really unique body that Jesus has placed together. Like he's the one who kind of brought us all together, positioned us together as his church. And you may look at yourself and think, Man, I don't belong here. Like, I don't fit. I don't have the gifts and the talents that other people have. Like, I just, I'm not sure I fit. But I want you to to hear what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18. 
He says, but now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. Can I just say that the sovereign God of the universe has brought you together with the body of Jesus Christ in this church, and he has placed you just as he saw fit. In his sovereign wisdom, he knows your giftedness, your strengths, your weaknesses, and he has placed you here to be a part of a body. And I, I, I've looked out and, and read the news and seen the things going on in, in our world, and to be honest with you, I haven't been encouraged the whole time. I haven't thought, oh, this is no big deal, man. The church is going to jump in, and we're just going to do a great thing. And to be honest with you, if I, I just shoot straight, the church in America has largely been anemic and powerless. Like One of those things I've struggled with since I was a kid is to read the New Testament, and you just see like these brand new believers, and they're boldly proclaiming the gospel, and lives are being transformed, and cultures are being shaped, and it was just this miraculous work that God was doing. And then I've actually grown up in the Church of America, and honestly, I've been largely disappointed. And I believe the reason for that is that we have this culture of rugged individualism in America, right? We're going to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, like no one tells us what to do. We're just going to kind of do our own thing, invest where we want to invest, and honestly back away where we want to back away. Most people in America have treated the church a lot like they would treat a restaurant with a buffet. The dominant question that says, am I going to be a part of that church or not, is do they serve what I want to consume? Do they do the music the way I want to do the music, like sing the kind of songs, and not only that, in the style I want to sing those songs? Do they have a killer children's ministry? What about my students, and what about women and men's, and, and what's the temperature like, and do they meet at convenient times? The question that we ask is similar to the question we ask when we choose a restaurant. Are they serving what I want to consume? You know what the scriptures teach us? You know what the Bible would have us do? It's not say, what can I consume from the church? And if they don't serve what I want, I'm going to go find another one. Instead, the scripture would say, you are a body and individually members of it. There are no non-essential workers in the church that we are supposed to come together, committing ourselves to one another, interdependent, kind of like a body. That, that what we understand is that this thing doesn't work well without all of its parts any more than our physical bodies work well without all of our parts. If everyone isn't committed to one another to say, I'm going to use the gifts that God has given me, the time, the talents, the treasure that God has given me to build up the body, then the body begins to suffer. But instead, we're individuals, right? We're Americans. We're free. So I'm not all that concerned about being committed to the body of Christ. I've got other things going. Kids have ball tournaments. I've got stuff going. I'm like, we, we're not a body. We're a bunch of body parts who pile ourselves together once a week, but other, otherwise never cooperate, never offer to one another what God has given us. You are individually members of the body placed here. Just as God has seen fit that the whole body might be built up and strengthened together through your gifts and your ability, the Holy Spirit at work through you. Membership is very important to us at Cross Community because we believe membership is very important in the Scriptures. Like We want to know who our members are. We want to know how you're gifted. We want to know that you are indeed investing and serving and building one another up in the body. We're a church. The head is Jesus, but we're the body. We are the hands and feet of Jesus to the world. And I want to see God use us in a powerful way. We've got to come together. We've got to choose to, to say, I'm going to commit myself to the people, to the membership of this church to allow God to use me for his purposes. Now, I want to be really clear. I want to have excellent music. Excellent, like preaching. I want to have great ministries to our kids. Like we, we believe that excellence honors God and it inspires people. When a, a lost person comes through our door, I want them to feel more loved and cared for, greater hospitality in this place than they will experience anywhere else in their entire life. And yet, for those of us who are here, it's not about us anymore. We're to be the contributors and not the 
consumers. And so I would just encourage you today to evaluate your standing in this church. Have you, have you committed yourself to this body? Are you using the gifts and talents and abilities that God has given you to build up the body of Christ here? So just to kind of clarify, we're the church. Jesus is the head. We are a body. We believe we are strengthened by our members to the extent that our members are connected and committed to one another, serve and contributing to one another. We are going to be strengthened. And we're going to see God do things here that otherwise our individual parts could never accomplish. We are strengthened by our members. So um, we are led by Christ, strengthened by every member. We're governed by elders. That's what we've been called to. We see that this body has been purchased by the blood of Christ, and we've been called to act as overseers, keeping watch over the souls of our members here, and our elders take that very seriously. We were meeting this week just praying about this body, praying for many of you by name, for our community groups and leaders and deacons and all the people in this body. We take it seriously. We are served by a body of deacons who are second to none. Who are calling me on the phone like, what else can we do? They've been going crazy through this time of separation. They can't make visits in the hospital. Like they haven't been able to do the things that they do. We're governed by elders. We're served by deacons. But we are strengthened by every single member. Now, I want to be clear about something because this has been a misnomer in the church for years. Many people have come to the idea or the conclusion that we're going to pay some staff and they're going to do the work. We're going to hire in some people with some gifts and abilities, and they're going to get busy. They're going to go do the evangelize, and they're going to go visit people, and they're going to go share, and they're going to do all this. Can I just tell you a real core belief that we have? We believe with all of our hearts that God caused you to be born when you were born into the family that you have been born into. You've been given the gifts and the abilities to to provide you a place to go to work, that maybe you're in a school like God has seen fit to place you at this time in your family, among your friend group, in your place of business, that you might be Jesus to those people. That it might be because you have the Holy Spirit of God and because you're a part of his church, you have been redeemed by his blood, that it might be not just you showing up with all your, your brokenness or your struggles, but it might be like Jesus is in your family. That it might be like Jesus is in your workplace or in your school or among your friend group. That as you sit out at the ball fields, that you might be Christ to people who desperately need to see it. We're the church of God. If we don't, who else is going to? Watch the news and let it make you grieve. We're the church of Jesus. He's called us to this. We're strengthened by our members. We're called to do a great work. Now, here's the thing. Our staff, Ephesians 4, 11, and 12, says he's given some as apostles and prophets and teachers and preachers. Basically, he's gifted people like what we have among our staff. And he's given them those gifts for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. We want to help you be that person in your family. We want to help you become that person in your workplace. We want to equip you to do the work of the ministry. We believe that every member of our church is a minister, that you should be active in advancing the kingdom of God. So, just to recap, we're a church. Jesus is our head, and we are the body. We're the hands and feet of Jesus to our community. But there's more than that. We're not just any church. Uh, a number of years ago, if you're an old timer, you might uh, tell people you go to Emmanuel. I guess the church I grew up in right here, this old building, it was Emmanuel Baptist Church. And a number of years ago, we just prayed through, do we want to um, keep that name or change it? And, and honestly, uh, we wanted to celebrate more than just Emmanuel Baptist Church. We felt God maybe leading us in that direction that we should shift the name. And the, the first part of our name is that of the cross. And the reason we wanted the cross in our name is because we are a group of people for whom the cross has changed everything in our lives. Like the cross was the central moment in history of our lives. Like the cross has changed everything. You may not know this, but if you're sitting next to one of the members of our church, you are sitting next to a world-class sinner. 
If you knew their story, if you could just read the book of things that they had done, you might want to find a new place to sit. Like you would definitely feel awkward, right? There would be some some angst among us if you knew the sin of the people of Cross Community Church. But here's the thing. Because of the cross, the Bible tells us we're no longer world-class sinners. The scriptures call us saints because of the work of Jesus for us. Here's the thing. For us world-class sinners, Jesus went to the cross, and what God did is he took our sin, and he took our shame, and he took our our guilt and those labels that have followed us our whole lives. And he placed those on his son, Jesus, like Jesus bore all of our sin and all of our shame and all of our guilt. And he credited to us his righteousness. So we used to be sinners, but now we've been called saints. The reason we want cross in our name is because we want to be reminded of who we are in Christ Jesus. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. We have been given a new name and a new identity because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We are a church of users and abusers, of addicts and adulterers, of liars and manipulators. We are the unwanted and the rejected, the unruly, the outcast, the rebellious, the fatherless, the abandoned, the deadbeats, and the despised. If you went around this room, we've worn a thousand different labels, most of them shameful. But because of the cross of Jesus Christ, everything has changed for us. Look here, and this is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. It tells us something different about ourselves. This is why we want to be reminded of the cross every single day, every time we mention the name of our church. 2 Peter 2, 9 says, You are not the outcast. You're not the rejected. You're not the overlooked. You're not the despised. You're not the unwanted. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, You are chosen. We are a chosen race. Like God saw all of it, and he chose us anyway. We are a chosen race. We are a royal priesthood. Remember the priests of the Old Testament? They were the only ones allowed to enter into the presence of God. And then only with blood, only after the ceremonial washings, like they had to enter into the presence of God on behalf of the people. Only they were allowed. But guess what? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we're now a kingdom of priests. Like Cross Community Church, we're about to like, you know, break the huddle here. And we're going to go out into the community as a kingdom of priests priests. We're going to represent people to God. We're going to go and we're going to be praying. Like face to face, we can pray to God directly. We don't need an intermediary because our sins have been washed away. We come as priests into the presence of God and we intercede on behalf of our friends and our family and our neighbor and our community asking God to do in them what he's done in us. We are a kingdom of priests. Like we're not the same because of the cross of Jesus Christ. We're a chosen race, a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. And for most of us, we would have never attached the word holy to our name before. But because of the cross, the sinful have been made holy. We are a people for God's own possession. He's adopted us as his own children. We belong to God. I want you to hear the rest. All of that so that we might Proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Because of the cross of Jesus, we've been given new names and new identities and a new purpose. We are cross community church, and we don't want to forget that. We don't want to forget who we were before Christ, and we don't want to stop telling people about Jesus Christ, about the gospel. If you want to know why we take time every week to talk about the great exchange, Jesus took your sin and gave to you his righteousness, about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the reason we're going to talk about that week in and week out is because that is the event that changed everything for us. And honestly, if there's no death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we should go find something else to do. That is the defining mark of a Christian. The work of Jesus on our behalf. So we're a church. The head is Christ and we're the body. And we're the visible representation of Jesus to the world. We're focused on the cross. But there's another word in our name that I'm deeply thankful for. And it's the word community. The word community reminds us that this is not a holy huddle and it's not about us. That we have been placed here strategically to represent Jesus Christ. Like, sometimes people get offended. 
This is a, hey, it's a, it's a pandemic. How dare you ask people to serve and deliver meals? How dare you ask people to get out and risk themselves for other people? How dare you ask people to give when they may not have jobs or they may, you know, their, their income may be limited right now? And let me just say, we are never going to apologize for asking our members to participate in the ministries of this church because who else is going to go? This is the Apostle Paul who would celebrate that whoever shall call on the name of the Lord, they will be saved, right? Like we celebrate the work of God, but then Paul asks us a question. He says, now, how are they going to hear without someone to preach to them? Like how are they just going to come to faith if no one tells them about the gospel of Jesus Christ? We are Cross Community Church because this is not about us. We're not here to be a holy huddle and insulate ourselves from that really terrible world out there. What we're not going to do is sit and trash our our culture and all the things that are going on. What we're going to do is gather here to encourage one another that we might engage that broken culture. It is dark and it is ugly and we are the agents of light. I mean, Jesus said it. He's like, hey, you're you're the light of the world. Us. You. You're the light of the world. Yes, like, who would light a lamp and then put it under a a basket? We're not here to come and insulate ourselves from the world. We come together as cross-community church to go out and make a difference in our world, to go take light into the darkness. The suffering in this world due to sin is real. This is a dark moment in our nation. There is the darkness of a thousand different names. The darkness of injustice, of oppression, of racism, the darkness of hatred and violence, of rioting and looting and killing, the darkness of addiction, of abuse, and you just keep on naming it. The darkness is really evident. My question is, will the church show up? Will we be about the work of Jesus? Will we go to the people that Jesus went to? The parable of the Good Samaritan. The least likely of people showed up to do the work of God, to be the neighbor, to love the neighbor. And that's what we ought to be. We ought to be going to the least likely of people and saying, God, listen, I don't know that I have all the gifts and all the abilities, but I'm going to offer you what I have. I'm going to go in the name of Jesus and offer myself to our community. And so we are going to unapologetically ask you, to use what God has given you, to articulate the gospel on a regular basis, just telling the story of what Jesus has done for you, to your friends and your family and your neighbors. We are going to ask you not just to give, but to give sacrificially to the work of this church and a thousand other organizations who are advancing the kingdom of God. We're going to ask you to serve and use your gifts and abilities. Jesus, he told the parable of talents. And there's a really sad story about a guy who had been entrusted with a great sum of money. But he was afraid. We don't know what the fears are. He just says that he was afraid. So rather than put that talent, that money to use, he buried it. I am guess he had those, those same what-ifs what that go through our mind. Like, well, what about my health insurance? And what about retirement? And what about the college? And what about, and what about, and what about? tragedy is he just buried it. Now, the story isn't all tragic, though, because there were two guys who took what they had been given, and they invested it all, building the kingdom of their master. You know what happened with the guys who invested everything? They were given more. We know that those who are faithful with little will be entrusted with more, and so we courageously, we like, we're excited to ask you to give sacrificially to the kingdom of God. We're excited to ask you to use the gifts and abilities that God has given you to extend the kingdom. And Jesus would say this, for those of you who are worried about those things, the what-ifs in your life, Jesus would say, seek first the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all those things are going to be added to you. Your heavenly Father knows your needs. He's going to provide for you. So we, we're a church. Jesus is our head and we're the body. We're going to focus on the cross. And we're going to choose to minister in our community. We're going to go out as lights into the darkness. We're going to call you to do that every single week. Now, if you're here and you're a guest today and you're a little bit overwhelmed, I'm just trying to be clear about the direction we feel that God is leading us as a church. And honestly, our invitation is to come and join us. 
If you've been attending here for, you know, like today's your first day or you've been here for 10 years, the invitation is come be a part of what God is doing in this church to come and commit yourself. We actually have a membership class coming up at the end of this month. If you want to know more, kind of get the, the nuts and the bolts on the 28th of June, 1230. You can sign up online right now and come and join what God is doing here. But if you're a member and you're like me, it's been a season of being distracted. Maybe you're kind of out of the practice. Maybe you've just been holed up at home. Today is a day to be reminded of what we've been called to as the church of Jesus Christ. So here in just a minute, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to invite you to, to just evaluate a few things about your life. Are you using what God has given you to further the kingdom of God? Are you seeing yourself as, a, as an essential worker, if you will, knowing that the gifts and abilities God has given you are supposed to be used for the building up of the body? Are you leveraging the treasure that God has given you to extend the kingdom of God? Are you giving sacrificially? Or are you tempted to be like the guy that buried the talent? Are you speaking the message of the cross, which we believe changes everything? Are you sharing that message with the people around you? In our time of response today, I just want to invite you to consider and pray through those things and then just to surrender yourself to God. Say, God, I can't do anything apart from you. But there's nothing you can't do through me, through the power of your spirit. And so just take a few minutes to, to consider during this time of response. Repent if you need to repent. But just to say, God, I, I believe the, the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. So, yeah, I'm going to pray that you'll send others, but here am I, send me. Let, me. let me pray for us. Father, grateful for this church. My life is a product of men and women who chose to give and chose to serve and chose to offer themselves on your behalf. Like I was saved and baptized here, and I want a thousand other people to tell that story. Oh, God, would you use us in the midst of our broken world where people are hating one another and killing one another? And Lord, it doesn't look like the, the portrait of the world that, that I believe you would desire. And so, Father, would you use us to be ministers of reconciliation? Would you use us to be peacemakers? Would you use us to carry the hope of Jesus Christ, the message of the cross to the people around us? God, may we be a church who honors and glorifies you in all that we say and do. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand up?